Well, in line with uh, the, the previous presentations, I'll be talking about TMS EEG and PET fMRI and focusing a little bit more on, on Thetaverse simulation and how those techniques can are, are useful to study the, the neural effects uh, of uh, Thetaverse. So as a quick outline, I will give a very, very brief overview uh, of uh, TBS and RTMS. I think you've heard a lot <laughs> about the, those two techniques over the, the past two days. And then move on to talking about TMS EG studies and focusing a little bit more on how we can use CMS EG to, um, to, to better determine uh, Thetaverse simulation uh, parameters when we're outside of the motor cortex. So what, what's the utility of TMS EG uh, regarding that? And moving on to afterwards a completely different topic, which uh, is combining molecular imaging, so PET, uh, as well as fMRI with Thetaverse stimulation. But I will focus a little bit more on PET and then talk about some recent uh, preliminary data from my lab where we combine PET and fMRI. Uh, to study uh, TBS mechanisms, and finally talk about uh, some recommendations for, for future studies. So first of all, very briefly, uh, Thetaverse simulation mechanism and principle. So, so we know that for very early on in the, de the development uh, of TMS, RTMS was introduced, and now there is uh, a lot of data showing that uh, at least uh, in some people, uh, low frequency RTMS will reduce cortical excitability in the motor cortex, where, uh, whereas a high frequency is typically, uh, um, uh, we typically see uh, an increase in cortical excitability in motor regions. And, and in 2005, uh, 2004, 2005, data burst simulation was introduced. And it was really based on uh, how we can uh, apply uh, uh, plasticity uh, uh, protocols in uh, brain slices, animal brain slices, uh, in which typically it is a 100 hertz frequency that is used with four pulses. Uh, so the, the parameters were a bit changed to, uh, to make it feasible with an RTMS machine in humans. And we now know that in, th in Thetaverse simulation, we use triplets uh, that are sent at 50 hertz with a, a five hertz um, uh, interval in between. And we know that if we, uh, at least in the motor cortex, if we uh, use a, an intermittent protocol, we can increase excitability in a continuous uh, protocol, we can uh, decrease excitability. Uh, after a few years, uh, some clinicians saw the potential there in using uh, that very short protocol uh, uh, for clinical applications, uh, such as the case of depression. So Thetaverse was uh, uh, approved by the FDA uh, uh, in 2018 following the, the publication of a large trial where they showed that in, uh, I think it was on average 400 patients uh, uh, the Thetaverse ITBS, so intermittent uh, Thetaverse simulation is as efficient uh, as uh, high frequency RTMS in reducing uh, symptoms of depression. So instead of using uh, 45 minutes uh, daily treatment, uh, we could use uh, three minutes daily treatments. Uh, so it's becoming more and more the gold standard in, uh, in clinical studies, at least for depression, for treatment of depression, because of the the large gain in, in time that, that, is, uh, that is made by using Thetaverse. However, how has, uh, as for other uh, NIBS uh, technique, uh, we don't fully understand the mechanisms uh, of action of Thetaverse simulation. And, and we, we also, when using Thetaverse or RTMS in the clinical population, we are faced with some, some issues because we typically determine the parameters of stimulation in the motor cortex, and, but we don't really know if uh, we can just apply those parameters to any regions of the brain, especially the prefrontal cortex that is very different and anatomically than the, the motor cortex that is much more uh, organized and, and easy to study, I would say. Uh, so this is where uh, combining TMS EG uh, can be uh, with Thetaverse can, can be very interesting. So as I just mentioned, uh, even though it is used clinically, 
everything is determined in the motor cortex, and 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 this this can be uh, led to some issues because we know we don't really know if the same intensity, the same dose is uh, is required to stimulate uh, other cortical regions of the brain. And up until recently, it was very hard to we didn't really have a technique that allowed to have some output that is similar to the MEP to be able to to measure uh, those parameters. So you've heard about TMS EEG, so I will talk very briefly uh, about it. But so in recent year, because of some uh, engineering uh, advances in, in EEG amplifiers and just in, in the way we use uh, we use TMS in combination with other uh, neuroimaging techniques, we're, we're not able to combine TMS and EEG and and we're able to measure the EEG response in the first uh, 300 milliseconds after uh, we send a pulse. And uh, we now know that uh, in several cortical regions of the brain, we can obtain what, we, what is called a, a TEP, so a TMS above potential, that, ha that have some peaks and troughs that we that are well known and that are starting <laughs> to understand a little bit what they're uh, associated with. So for example, critical inhibition or excitement excitability. So although it is not as, uh, I would say, straightforward as the MEP, it is uh, as close to an MEP uh, that we can have outside uh, of the motor cortex. Another interesting thing with TMS EEG, even in motor regions, is that we can have a little bit more than just cortical excitability. So we can measure uh, connectivity, source localization. So there's there's some interesting analysis that are, are uh, that are available by using this technique that are uh, not necessarily available with the EMG. So uh, one of the first uh, TMS EG studies. So I'll be focusing more on prefrontal vertebral stimulation because this is where I think uh, when we're we're outside of the motor cortex, this is where I think. Uh, it, it is very interesting also to use TMS EG and, and, and neuroimaging. Uh, so I'll be focusing on, on prefrontal stimulation. Uh, so more specifically, the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, so one of the first studies I looked into, the, the question was quite simple. It was, can we see a change with TMS EG uh, when we use uh, TBS uh, uh, over the DLPFC? Uh, this was uh, conducted by Chung and collaborator. And they showed evidence that uh, ITBS uh, was able to modify uh, TEP amplitudes in comparison with CHAM and also um, change some cortical evolved uh, oscillations, especially uh, gamma and theta uh, oscillation. Uh, CTBS did not show as strong effect, but did show some, uh, some reduction in theta and gamma uh, oscillation. So that was one of the so that was an interesting first study showing that it, we could use TMS EG uh, to, to measure uh, prefrontal uh, theta burst stimulation. The same group did uh, several follow-up studies where they looked into how can we use TMS EG to uh, optimize prefrontal TBS uh, parameters. Um, so for example, in two studies that they, they published in 2018, uh, they looked at uh, uh, comparing one block of ITBS versus two blocks of ITBS. And all these questions are very relevant to uh, clinical applications. So we don't, uh, we don't really know. <laughs> so there's a lot of studies that are starting to do uh, even 10 blocks of stimulation a day. And we don't really know these effect, the, the, the effect on, on brain activity. So those type of very basic question, uh, I find very interesting. Uh, so in that case, they didn't show any difference um, in using two blocks of ITBS versus one block in, in comparison with CHAM. So again, they show uh, potentiation using TEPs, but no difference whether you stimulate one or two blocks of ITBS. Uh, in a follow-up study, they looked at intensity, which is also very relevant uh, to clinical studies. So uh, there has been over the past, uh, I would say, three, four years, a tendency to slowly increase uh, ITBS intensity close to what uh, is seen in our RTMS uh, uh, protocols where instead of using 80% of the active threshold, uh, 
uh, clinicians are using 110%, 120% of their resting threshold, which is uh, very different. Uh, and then 80%, so it's much higher, and uh, much higher intensity, uh, which can produce more side effects and may not be uh, more efficient, but we don't really know. So in that study, they looked at three different intensity. They went up 200%, so they didn't go as high as they go, uh, as we, we can see in clinical studies uh, at the moment. And what they showed is, Interestingly, a U-shaped relationship between intensity and after effect where 75% of our MT showed the best effects and 50%, 100% uh, they didn't show uh, uh, as strong effects. Uh, and 75% of ITBS in their protocol, I would say, uh, the 75%, sorry, of the resting threshold is so the closest to the 80% of active threshold. Uh, that they used in their study. So uh, again, I find showing the, the how TMS and can, can be useful to help us design our clinical studies afterwards. And, and finally, in an other interesting study, uh, the, the group, uh, same group uh, showed that uh, if you use individualized ITBS, so to do so, uh, they determine the frequency that was used for uh, the theta and gamma. So the five Hertz and 50 Hertz was individualized based on a theta gamma coupling uh, uh, shown on the EEG during a three uh, uh, and back, a three back, sorry, uh, task. And they showed that it was more efficient to use an individualized frequency. So again, suggesting that so this could be a potentially uh, used in, with the clinical population to increase uh, the clinical, clinical effect or at least increase the after effects on brain activity. Uh, one thing that I didn't go into details in, in those studies uh, is, however, that the effects on the TEPs have been variable. So they did not replicate on each of their study the same effect, for example, on the N100 or the P200 or P60. So there, there is variability. So th there isn't so far a very clear uh, profile of, of effects of theta burst stimulation uh, in the prefrontal cortex, not as clear as we can see, for example, uh, on MEPs in the motor cortex. So in follow-up to those studies, uh, I was interested in looking at dose, but uh, dose more in terms of the number of pulses. And this, uh, this idea came uh, when I first uh, started um, uh, my lab in which uh, I, I was asked to design uh, in the hospital where I'm working a clinical trial uh, for treatment of, of depression. And I was trying to review all the literature to try to see what, what's, what has been done and what would be the best in terms of parameters. And I, I became quickly very lost because we know that the Tetraverse uh, uh, protocol is 600 pulses. However, in clinical studies, along with an increase in, uh, in intensity of stimulation, a lot of studies started to increase uh, the number of pulses. And, and the idea, that if we increase dosage, we will increase uh, the clinical effects. But this was never tested. Uh, there's only a few studies that tested the number, uh, the, the effect of number of pulses in the motor cortex uh, using MEPs and actually showed some reversal of effects if you increase uh, the, the, the dosage in terms of pulses. And there was no study that looked into that uh, in the prefrontal cortex. So uh, in that study, uh, we, uh, we recruited 14 AFP controls in which they uh, went for three different sessions where we, uh, we stimulated with Fediverse at 600, 1200, and 1800 pulses, which were uh, the, the stimulation dose that was the most frequently used in, in clinical studies. And we compared um, before and after stimulation a single pulse TMS to the DLPFC, but also paired pulse, so LICI and SICI. And for single pulse studies, so this is here the 
the ground average of the three conditions. So first of all, we didn't see any effect of those. So regardless of those, the effect were the same and it was uh, far from being different actually. So pretty convincing. Uh, there was absolutely no difference between the three conditions. And we, de we did see uh, a tendency for a decrease in the amplitude uh, of the TAPs, which is, was a bit, which was against what we expected. Uh, so based on, on motor cortex studies, you know that uh, we expect an increase with ITBS. And in this case, the three different conditions decrease cortical excitability. Uh, so this was surprising, but at the same time, there's not that much data available on the prefrontal cortex. So it is possible that we don't induce the same effect as in the, um, in the motor cortex. We also saw a decrease uh, in uh, theta power following, uh, following theta burst emission in our three conditions. For single and pair pulse data, uh, for pair pulse data, sorry, and it, it was a, a little bit more complex, but again, we did see a tendency towards uh, not a tendency, we saw a significant uh, reduction of, uh, of inhibition for both SICI and LICI uh, following telebrace stimulation, uh, which was again a bit counterintuitive if we think that uh, we're, we're increasing excitability. And we saw again an effect on theta association. So the portrait was quite consistent across the three different uh, dosages. And uh, so uh, this is clearly a first step as it all those studies have been done in healthy controls. And I think another question that we can ask ourselves is, would we see the same thing in a clinical population? Because we know, for example, they may not start, they may not have the same baseline cortical excitability. So the effect, of the plasticity effect may be different. So it's very important to replicate that in a clinical population. But it's, this is a first education and it may not be we not, may not gain anything by increasing the dosage of stimulation in clinical studies. And it's more time for, for patients as well. So you've heard previously about the current challenges. Uh, so of course the same are uh, present when we use TMS EEG. Uh, so it is well known, at least with MEPs, that there is some variability of effects. Studies are starting to uh, look into the variability of the effect using TEPs. I think once we have a better portrait of the, the effect, for example, of Fediverse on prefrontal TEPs, it'll be easier to look then into variability because we know what to expect. Uh, but definitely we can see a variability in TEPs as well, in the direction of changes uh, after stimulation. So this is something for sure to keep in mind uh, when using TMS EEG. And it's good to go dig a little bit in, in, in your data and look at, at that var variability in, in the induced changes. Another challenge with TMS EEG is the to control for somatosensory and, and, and its very auditory potentials, which has been an important topic in the field uh, over uh, the past, uh, I would say, two, three years. So there's been a recent study uh, by uh, the Rathwell group, so uh, Rocky, uh, Renzo Rocky and, and collaborators that did a very clever experiment where they tried to isolate each of the components in the in the motor cortex. So isolate the contribution to auditory responses, uh, to somatosensory responses using a combination of factor. Uh, one of them was using efficient masking, so uh, uh, noise masking. So in this case, they used uh, um, a white noise with earbuds and ear defenders on top of it to really mask. Uh, and they also uh, asked participants for feedback in terms of the, the sound they were, they were hearing from the TMS click. And, and they did electrical stimulation of the scalp as well uh, using uh, just uh, electrical electrodes uh, that, uh, that they put on, under the coil. So I won't go into details in the, in the result because there's a lot of conditions, 
But basically what they showed was quite encouraging, at least for the motor cortex uh, and the, for the parameters they used, uh, in which if there's proper noise masking, uh, it is possible to uh, observe a clear uh, TEP response that is minimally confounded by uh, uh, somatosensory and auditory evoked potentials. So this is this is good news for, for the field, but it highlights how important it is to properly mask the noise and, and use all the recommendations from the field uh, and if possible have a sham condition as well uh, to um, try as much as possible minimize the the the, the confound of, of the, those potentials that I think we cannot ever fully uh, remove, but it's it's the same for MRI as well. So uh, now I'm gonna switch topic a little bit. Uh, so I didn't look at what time I started, uh, but pretty much outweigh, I think. Um, so now I'll talk about a combination of uh, PET imaging uh, with RTMS and, and theta burst simulation. So I'll go back a little bit to RTMS. The reason being that PET uh, has been used a lot in the 90s and early uh, year 2000, but after that, uh, MRI took over. So there's not that many recent studies that uh, use PET with theta burst simulation. So uh, we recently uh, did a review of the literature on the use of PET uh, to better understand the neural mechanisms of, uh, of RTMS. Uh, as I'm, in, uh, I'm introducing PET uh, as, a, as a technique in, in my research, uh, my current research, and I wanted to have a really good overview of uh, what has been done. And this made me realize how important PET has been in our knowledge of the effects of the neural effects of RTMS and how it, yeah, just the, the, the first seminal findings were a lot using PET. So, uh, in, for example, uh, by, in a study by Fox and colleagues in 1997, uh, they showed that uh, for the first time that if we stimulate uh, uh, the left primary motor cortex with low frequency RTMS, we can see changes in blood flow, some local changes uh, in, in M1, but also surrounding motor areas and, and the contralateral M1. So this was using uh, uh, blood flow as a, as a marker. There's been also other tracer, tracer that have been used, such as FDG to look at glucose me metabolism and Racopi to use that dope, to look at dopamine. Uh, so there's a, a series of studies that were done by Zinder and colleagues in, in the end of the year to, uh, 1990. And uh, they showed that uh, there is a highly similar pattern of results between studies. So it seems like there is a, there are changes in uh, IPSI and contralateral uh, motor areas following RTMS of the motor cortex. Uh, dopamine studies were also very important in, in our knowledge that uh, TMS can uh, actually uh, induce the changes that are more in deeper structures of the brain, such as uh, the striatum, for example. So in this review, uh, we uh, looked at all studies that use PET, R RTMS, and SPECT RTMS uh, in a healthy control in clinical population. So we uh, included 71 uh, papers. We did uh, look uh, at, uh, uh, we did look into doing a meta-analysis as much as we could, uh, but there's only uh, two regions in which we have sufficient data uh, that was uh, compatible. The first uh, region was uh, the left N1 with low, stimulated with low frequency RTMS. So in this, we included uh, eight, uh, eight studies. And what we showed, first of all, is that, so the, the size of the circle here is the, the, the variable, illustrates the variability in the targeting of the motor cortex. So we can see that it's quite consistent 
because it is easy to target the monocortex using MEPs. Uh, and what, uh, what the meta-analysis showed is that there is a strong effect in uh, the left M1 when we stimulate left M1, as well as the SMA that can be seen across those studies. Uh, we also looked at, well, all regions that were stimulated, but I wanted to talk in particular of the prefrontal cortex because that's the topic of the presentation. Um, so the, the picture is not as clear, again, for the prefrontal cortex, uh, even using neuromaging. So uh, using blood flow, there's been a lot of inconsistency on which regions were, uh, were activated. So what has been consistent is that the effects are very uh, remote so and widespread. And some studies show uh, more widespread uh, effects versus effects that are more uh, uh, restricted to the frontal singular network. One thing that has been consistent is that there doesn't seem to be a local effect. So there doesn't seem to be as strong as an effect locally under the coil as was seen in, uh, with the motor cortex. Same picture with other tracers, such as FPG and Rackle Pride. So there is inconsistency, uh, inconsistencies, but there seem to be, again, no local effect, but uh, an effect that seem to be uh, more widespread. So for example, with glucose, there's a lot of study that shows effects on the frontal singular network. And with dopamine, uh, some studies show the effect in, for example, the caudic nucleus. So again, showing that we can reach deeper regions uh, with, uh, with RTMS. In terms of clinical studies with depression, uh, there's a, a few studies that look into metabolic changes after a 10 hertz uh, RTMS sessions. But again, same picture as in healthy controls, inconsistent in terms of local effects and heterogeneous it, it, uh, widespread changes uh, were seen. So these studies are a little bit more recent. Uh, not so, some of them were uh, were done in 2010, but you can see that it, it wasn't used as much PET after 2010. Uh, nor fMRI was uh, was more used. And what we showed in the the meta analysis was first of all uh, that there was a lot of inconsistent, well, a lot of variability in the targeting, which might explain. Uh, why it's, the remote effects are different. And in terms of the meta-analysis, we didn't see anything. So uh, in so I think it was a total of uh, 91 subjects and we didn't see, oops, sorry. We didn't see any uh, pattern of changes that, that were seen, which was not surprising uh, given here, we can see that this is uh, the, the different dots show the peak activations for each studies and it's basically all, all over the brain. Now, so this is more, I wanted to introduce you a little bit to what has been done with PET because I find that this is a literature that is often a bit forgotten. And now uh, with the idea of combining molecular imaging with fetabird simulation to better understand the, the mechanism of action. So there's a, a single PET study that explored fetabird stimulation uh, in the prefrontal cortex. There's only two other clinical studies uh, that used cerebellar stimulation, uh, cerebellar fetabirds with uh, PET, and I think one in Parkinson. But that's that's it in terms of uh, of PET uh, and uh, in, in combination with fetabird. So in that study uh, by Lee and collaborator published in 2018, uh, they compared two weeks of treatment of uh, fetabird stimulation, either ITBS, CTBS, or bilateral, so combine ITBS and CTBS, and, and compared it with sham. And what they showed briefly is that, uh, again, it doesn't seem to be local effects, but rather effects in, in, in the in cingulate region, uh, cuneus region, and, and some effects in temporal region. So 
in line with what has been shown and in the healthy controls with our TMS. So in line with this gap in the literature, so the fact that there's no healthy control study that has been done with Fediverse, we, uh, we designed a study in which we looked at the effect of ITBS on glucose metabolism uh, compared with sham. And uh, at the hospital uh, research center where I work, we have a simultaneous PET fMRI scanner, which is uh, quite neat where we can uh, simultaneously uh, acquire, for example, resting state and, and PET images. So in that case, we, we did uh, three rounds of resting state during PET and uh, uh, after the injection of FDG tracer. So these are preliminary findings in eight LP controls, but uh, we, show, we showed some, uh, some results that are quite consistent with what have been shown so far in which uh, we do not see local effects. So on the left side, these are the PET results. So we did see uh, an increase in, uh, uh, sorry, a decrease in uh, uh, glucose activity in the insula coated and uh, anterior cigulate cortex, as well as some uh, connectivity effect in the insula and, and codate, codate uh, nucleus. So we are finally restarting that project after being in, in restrictions due to COVID for, for one year. And we hope to, uh, to complete a recruitment by, by this fall, so to get to 16 participants. Um, but the, the preliminary findings are, are very interesting and show that we, we can uh, have uh, quite strong neural effects of ITBS and LP control. And this is using the standard 600 pulses 80% of active motor uh, threshold uh, protocol. So I found that reassuring also that show that we, if we use our standard Fediverse protocol, uh, we can show some changes in, in brain activity and in healthy controls. So in uh, the goal also of our review uh, of the literature and meta-analysis was to come up with some recommendations for future uh, molecular imaging studies. And some of them we tried to take into, well, most of them we tried to take into account in, in our study. So uh, I think I'm starting to go over time, but very briefly, uh, we saw that mainly maybe because some of those studies were older, but there is a lot of inconsistencies in the targets, especially for non-motor targets. So uh, recommending the, the use on MRI-based neural navigation system, especially that in the case of PET, because there's often a delay between the injection of the tracer, we can do the simulation offline, well, outside of the scanner, and then go, uh, and then go in the scanner, which makes it easy to use neural navigation. And also using uh, induced, um, uh, models of induced electrical fields, better control conditions, some, such as realistic uh, sham codes, which we used in our study. So the sham code did uh, deliver some, um, some, some somatosensory stimulation and using larger sample sizes. So for example, our sample, our target sample of 16 uh, healthy controls would be the largest sample in uh, healthy controls with, with PET. And um, other, uh, I won't go through all the recommendations, but uh, one of them is using novel tracers, such as tracers of glutama, GABA, serotonin, as well as we now have some plasticity tracers uh, and MDA tracers, which I think would be super interesting to use with Fediverse Definition or, or RTMS. So as brief conclusions, so if I go back to the first part of, of my presentation, uh, I believe TMSCG offers a unique window in non-modern regions, modern as well, but it has a particular artist for me interest in, in using it in, not, in other cortical regions and hopefully will help define optimal parameters for the clinical study and help understand mechanism of action outside of motor regions. Um, However, it is important to be aware of the limitations of, uh, of that technique and include as many controls as possible. In terms of future uh, direction, one thing that I'm particularly in, interested in is using TMS-CG 
when we first start treatment as a marker of treatment response. So uh, I started a clinical trial in which we used TMF CEG at the first session, pre and post stimulation. And hopefully this give, give us an idea on how responsive the person's brain is to, our, to Thetaverse stimulation and in the future could be used to better select uh, treatment for, for the patient. Uh, combining it with the combining TMSCG with neuromaging studies is also very interesting, and I believe it, it will be important to compare motor versus non-motor regions in terms of mechanism of action. So, for example, in our study, we showed that it didn't seem to have the same uh, direction of effect in the prefrontal cortex. And in terms of molecular imaging, so I think that this is a very sensitive pet is very still useful for, uh, for studying the mechanism of, uh, of RTMS and Thetaverse. It is a very sensitive technique. We saw it with only eight participants, how uh, sensitive it can be. Like our, our effects were quite strong. And there's a big advantage of using it in combination with uh, simultaneously with the uh, functional imaging. So uh, in our study, we hope to also look at the correlations uh, between what we see with glucose metabolism and, for example, connectivity to try to see uh, if both measure, measures are corresponding. 